Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host as always, Steve Hall, and today I have Matt Jansen back on the podcast. Um, He came on episode 245 with Mike Isratel, which went down very, very well, but I think that left people wanting more from Matt because uh, he's rightly so becoming quite a big name within the bodybuilding scene uh, and has uh, some really, really good things to say. So I wanted to flush out more from Matt Uh, and actually starting Matt, if you're okay to, Uh, You actually became a full-time coach in 2013, so you've been in the game for a while, but I don't know if that sounds, to some people it might sound like not much time, it might sound like a lot of time to others, Um, but I think for people it might be really cool to hear because a lot of people listening are probably coaches themselves, and I think they'd be interested to hear kind of, yeah, what got you into coaching uh, initially? Yeah, yeah. Well, first off, thank you again for having me on. Um, I'm I'm more than happy to do this. I, I always try to view podcasts for me as that, you know, 18, 19 year old kid that just loved bodybuilding and was trying to soak up as much information as I could. And now that I have a platform, um, I just want to be able to give back. So thank you for having me on. Uh, So coaching for me, uh, basically, I started to realize kind of in high school that I had this ability to drive athletes that were better than me on the sports field and, you know, mentally push them due to my ability to kind of adhere um, you know, through conditioning and things like that. So I, I felt like early on, like I was kind of a, a leader in the realm of guys might genetically be better than me. They might be superior as an athlete, but I felt like I was respected in this kind of coaching realm and I was attracted to it, you know, initially early on. So then going into college, my degrees in exercise science, my, I, I initially, I started off initially wanting to be a physical therapist. Um, and I did over a hundred hours of volunteer work in physical therapy And what I realized is that there's such a select uh, small group of people that are in physical therapy that actually want to be there. Um, And it kind of, to me, wasn't really the environment that I enjoyed being in, whereas I wanted to be in an environment where athletes wanted to progress rather than being forced to be there. Um, So then I kind of shifted more to the uh, strength and conditioning field. Um, And I wanted to be a strength and conditioning coach at the collegiate level, professional level. And that was what I was shooting for. In the meantime, Um, From an athletic perspective, I was also playing Division II soccer in the United States. I got injured, and basically once I got injured and was no longer able to play, I kind of channeled all my competitive nature into bodybuilding training rather than sports-specific training for soccer at the time. Um, And I just – I fell in love with the gym. I fell in love with just being able to drive my performance up, my physique up, change the shape of my body – um, and this is something too, like, you know, kind of to go back even further, I, I remember from a very early age, you know, my dad was a huge fan of Sylvester Stallone, Rocky movies, but like what I was drawn to in those movies was the progression that he made from Rocky one through Rocky four. Um, you know, and, and I was just like aware of that at the age of seven, eight years old, I just kind of saw this transformation and I was just attracted to what he did with his physique. Um, so it's kind of always been a part of, of who I am. In college, I started to compete. I get I get confused on the dates, but I did my first show in 2010, in March of 2010, um, and I, and I love that experience. And then through that experience, um, I just started to kind of work with very very local people to my area. And there's a couple really good bodybuilders in my area that came to to work with me. Um, and again, I was just I was hungry to learn. I was hungry to grow. And more than anything, I just was passionate about helping people that I felt were better than me, but yet I could still channel and drive to make their physique better. Um, So my initial crop of athletes, and I always want to give credit to this, the first three people that I worked with are all now professionals. Um, Two, I helped turn pro. The other went and worked with Alberto Nunez and turned pro. Um, He is an IFPA natural pro. His name is David Kenny. I don't know if you've heard of him. And then I have um, crazy, crazy muscle bellies on this guy. And then also, uh, the first girl that I worked with, she turned pro at USA's in 2013. So I started working as a coach in 2010, 2011. Um, and then she turned pro in 2013. And then also, um, the first gentleman, other gentleman that I worked with, he turned pro at nationals as a middleweight. So again, like my initial crop of athletes was very, very good. Um, now granted, if I had been given like 
three average Joes, I might not ever be where I am today, you know, so I'm appreciative and I'm, I, I always kind of give credit there. So that was kind of my initial start is I, you know, I wanted to within how I transitioned from the strength and conditioning field to more so my own development as a coach was I actually interned at the University of Kentucky with their strength and conditioning program. That was the last phase of, of what I had to do before I had to graduate. And being in that program, there was a lot of good things that I learned. There was a lot of things that I learned that I, I might not possibly want to be a part of. Um, and ultimately, you know, after that experience, I went home and talked to my wife and I just said, I really ultimately want to be able to drive my own success or failure and not be dependent on a system. Um, and that's that's how I started coaching bodybuilders, really, on the on the scale that it was today or is today. Cool. Yeah, no, it's that's really interesting to hear your background because I mean, first of all, incredibly humble and uh, I think really nice that you are honest in the sense that maybe there was, I don't know if it's, I don't know if luck's the right word because I, I kind of hate that sometimes, but you've got some good people to work with from the get-go, which sure. is really great. But I mean, it's like having good genetics. If you don't put in the work, you're never going to see those genetics show themselves. Right. So right. you have to coach them well uh, in the yeah, first place yeah. to, to, to get the opportunity. And it's interesting to me because it, it sounds somewhat similar to, uh, if you know Cliff Wilson, who is a... Uh, Another do, yeah. quite big coach, um, particularly Tremendous the natural amount of respect for him. Totally. And I think he has somewhat of a similar background in that, like, he kind of just loved helping others. And I wouldn't say he either is like, he wouldn't say he's like a genetically very good person. In fact, he probably plays down his genetics a lot because they're, they're not amazing, but he's able to then help others really see out theirs. And I think that's the same for a lot of coaches. Like, a lot yeah. of the best coaches have had to really struggle to get results, and that makes them learn because they're not blessed to be able to, I don't know, anything works. So you right, end up becoming right. like a very good coach and help people maximize their own results. Yeah. I, um, it, it's kind of been brought to my attention lately too, with, you know, Sean winning the Olympia, like I've always been, it doesn't matter what I do. If I'm fully committed, I'm extremely competitive in what I do. So, so yes, I, I've absolutely, like, I always wanted to get into coaching to help people but I've always had this passion and, you know, and I want to like leave a, a mark on the industry and, and I want to be one of the best to ever do it. You know, like that's, that's what drives me. That's what wakes up. You know, I get up in the morning with this hunger and, and still to this day, you know, whether you think coaching since 2010 is, is a long time in the game or a short time in the game, like I still wake up with the same hunger and passion that I had as a young kid because I, I don't feel like I've arrived and I feel like I have so much more to accomplish. And, and, and because I am young, like, I still have so much experience to gain. And really to me, once you have that fundamental background, the experience over and over repeated, you know, repetitively going through the process is what's going to make you good. Yeah. Um, and, and in the same token, you know, like I just, I, I don't think that um, another thing about me is that I, as I'm always trying to advance in terms of just my education background and, and continued learning and, like I, there's so much more that I could grasp and, and better learn how to communicate with people because I, I honestly think like, yeah, there's the X's and O's of coaching, but more so than that, like you need to learn how to conf effectively communicate with different groups of people, different individuals to get the best out of them, to learn more about them. That really is what drives me is there's so many avenues within coaching that ultimately might lead to a win that I still can improve within. And that's something that I think comes across really well with you, Matt, is whilst clearly like, and I actually didn't even know that you had your uh, bachelor's in exercise science, which is awesome that you kind of have that background as well. Cause I think that gives you some fundamentals and also just shows that you're interested in learning and kind of had that desire. And obviously you spoke about it there, but I think the, I think you probably agree that you might be the best kind of PubMed or reading all the textbooks, but if coaching isn't really about your knowledge necessarily, it's about applying it. And like you said, and the thing I wanted to pick up on was like relationships from what I gather from you, Matt, is you have great relationships with your clients. Yeah. I mean, I, I, that's the thing. I think like, and I spoke about this a few days ago on another podcast, but I think you could pick a lot of coaches and, and potentially win a pro card with that coach. Um, but I think in order to really make it to the top, and again, like there's just something within my nature, like where I, I've always wanted to be at the top of the sport, um, you know, and, and in order to be there, there has to be more than just a surface level relationship, um, you know, and, and I, again, for those of you that, that may have listened to other podcasts, then, then just forgive me here, but there's an example, I really like to go into different realms of athletics and just like soak up things that coaches say, and Jimmy Johnson, who was a coach of the Dallas Cowboys, 
when they were winning their Super Bowls, he shared a story of basically how he had to communicate to Emmett Smith, who was a running back, and Michael Irvin, who was a wide receiver. He had to communicate to them in the in two completely different ways. He said ultimately that the end message was the exact same, but how he had to navigate getting to that message to get the most out of those two individuals was completely different. Um, and, and, you know, like that, those are like, what I love the most is when a game is over and the coach gets up on the press conference, and I just like sit there and I'm like, what is this guy going to tell me that I can then apply to what we're doing in bodybuilding? Because yeah, the X's and O's and the experience and having the visual eye to see somebody in front of you and know how to get from where they're at to the final look and the, and the peaking process, like that's all there, but like, it's so much more than that. If you truly want to be the best and, and really get the most out of your athletes. Yeah, absolutely. I think I can definitely speak to that. I find when I can, when my athletes let me build a relationship with them, cause you know, some people just, I don't know, they want the surface oh. almost, but when, yeah. and you have to earn their trust. Of course, I always sure, say that like, sure. I, I want them to be honest with me, but I'm like, I realize I need to earn that honesty and that kind of trust to be able to communicate like that. And right. yeah, I mean, it takes a certain individual with who has lots of empathy and who can kind of communicate effectively to do that. And so, like you said, some coaches, I, I think some of that is obviously you can develop it through experience, but I think some of it is just innate in some individuals versus others. Yeah. And too, on the, on the flip side of that, what, what I think is important I'm trying to convey to people now is just like you're saying that we as coaches have to earn their trust. I think some people come to me and see the relationships that I have with athletes and just automatically assume that I'm going to have that with them. But what they're missing out on is, is that's a process that takes time. Like just like in a dating relationship, if you try to date, to rush that relationship, it's not going to typically end up well, you know? So like those of you watching this that maybe work with me and don't feel like you have that relationship yet or potentially want to work with me or, or any good coach, like realize that real relationships take real time. You know, like the, the relationship that Sean Clarita and I have, we have that because we've worked together since 2016. The relationship we had in 2016, wins or losses taken out of the equation is not the same relationship we have in 2020, 2021, because we've grown as individuals, we've grown in our communication, we've learned how to better effectively communicate with each other. And it's just a natural process. It's not it's not a forced or rushed process. Yeah, I think that's really important to say because yeah, again, like, and I think uh, when you do work online and you have many kind of clients, uh, it's easy for people to come and go. And it can be frustrating, at least on my end, where you do want to build that relationship. And you're like, I can't really see like we have a three month minimum sign up. So someone can sign up, but they have to say for three months. But if I'm honest, even in three months, unless it's just pure fat loss, it's, it's, it's not going to be huge. Exactly. Yeah. You want them for like six months, longer, longer, longer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is hard when you have the right intentions in coaching. Um, and there's people that are skeptical of this, but truly, if you have the right intentions, it's not about the price point that you're asking for, for three months or six months. It's really that, that's how long it takes to show the value. And the real value is six months plus. Yeah. So, you know, when, when you guys are working with a coach or, or possibly inquiring with a coach and you can't look at it as, hey, bro, what's your prices? You know, it's, hey, what are you going to, what value can you give me over the next three to six months commitment, over the next year commitment? What can I expect to learn from you? Those are the types of questions that I would be asking a prospective coach is more so about like, what what can I do to help you guide me as best as possible? And not like, hey, what do you charge? Because if you just base it off of a price point, the relationship is then typically going to be based off of that price point. Yeah. You know, it's going to be more so customer service and actual true coaching. And, and it really, both parties have to be aware of that. Um, but ultimately, we are customer service representatives, you know, and, and that's the one that's the one thing that I always struggle about bodybuilding and, and physique coaching is that you know, it's a, it's a here today, gone tomorrow. What have you done for me today type mentality with a lot of individuals. Um, whereas for example, Nick Saban, he can get stuck into an athlete one day and he knows for a shadow of a doubt that that athlete is going to return the next day to practice because they have this bigger goal in mind that they're looking to achieve. Whereas, you know, within, within the physique realm, if you tell somebody, Hey, you're not working hard enough. Hey, your fat's too high right now. We got to get your fat down they could take offense to that and the next day be gone, you know? So it, it, it is a hard dynamic for sure. Absolutely. Um, I think something that I would be, I think people would be interested to hear about as well is I think 
you you talked about kind of having worked with Alberto Nunez, I think, in the past. And um, obviously, I think you everyone is at one stage natural, obviously, and then they go enhance. Do you work with both? And do you see many differences in coaching between them? Because I think that's like a just it's kind of a hot topic and obviously um, not you're a great person to ask about that. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I fully appreciate that I started coaching as a natural competitor and natural athlete um, because I truly understand the role that proper nutrition and nutrition changes can make over time versus having this reliance on the other mechanisms that we have in the toolbox as enhanced athletes. Um, I'm so thankful for that, you know. Um, also just because you just mentioned it, like there's, there's three coaches that I worked with that I really always want to show appreciation to, um, Jason Theobald was the first, Alberto was the second, and then Neil Hill was the third. And, and all these men have shaped the coach that I am today. What I appreciate the most about Alberto was how he really tried to grow relationally with me. And then also how he conveyed information, um, I'll say it. Alberto says it. Alberto is not the first, the fastest like responder. Um, that's not his style. But what I do appreciate by him is so many, so many times he picked up his phone and videoed himself going through my check in, reading it, responding to it, helping me analyze it, you know, what to work on, what to assess. Like he just really tried to just interact with me and I, and I appreciated that so much with him and, and also another thing that he did for me was really weed out what was important and what wasn't important um you know not stressing on invari variables like omega-3 intake in a day you know like things like, like there's so many minute things especially from seems like the natural community that they stress over that really yeah. in the grand scheme of things doesn't matter um and if you kind of reallocated that stress to just training hard in the gym you'd make a lot more progress than worrying about your, you know, your DHA content and omegas or, you know, things like that. So um, I appreciate him a lot, but, but going back to coaching naturals versus coaching enhanced, I think there's a lot of things, especially with the, the proper coaching within the natural community that they're doing right. You know, like the periodization that they're using um, proper exercise selection order, training they're not just winging it in the gym um for a greater it seems like they're really really sound as, and as far as a community of driving up progress in the right way um one of the things that i try every year to be more and more aware of is checking natural athletes blood work all throughout different phases of their off season and contest prep much like i would an enhanced athlete um, and for those of you guys listening that are natural, obviously the, the issue isn't to, to organ detriment, things of that nature. But what I see time and time again, especially with the guys that really, really train hard, is just hormonal downregulation as a natural athlete. So with that being said, I think you at least need to be aware of it. Um, and another issue that I have, again, because these guys assume that they're healthy, and, and yes, they are, is that they have no standard baseline for, for blood work. So for example, they could be feeling bad post prep or, or in prep and we get their blood work checked and, um, you know, it's showing down regulation and testosterone potentially, but we have no baseline because these athletes are not getting their blood work checked enough to know what, you know, what their proper elevation should be at. So that's one thing I would really encourage you guys is just to get baseline numbers in your off season of what your free test is looking like, what your TSH, free T3, free T4 are looking like, even as a natural this isn't just important in the enhanced community In the enhanced community. It's honestly important for a different reason, but it's equally important. I think for both of us. And then even outside of the physique realm, like if you want to be the best in anything and you're relying on your body to do that, you should know how your body's operating internally um, at all phases, you know, so that, that, that to me, it, you know, if I could say anything like when I'm working with natural athletes, I'm just as aware to make sure that they're checking their blood work. Um, because I find issues often, but yet a lot of times we don't have a, a prerequisite baseline of where they, they were coming from initially. That's It's really interesting because uh, you are pro probably the second person really who, if you know Broderick Chavez, uh, he like he's a like he just works with a lot of people on anabolics and we had a whole episode talking about blood work and he was very much the same as you in terms of like natural athletes having regular blood work um so it's interesting it's almost like you need to have 
go onto the enhanced side to realize the value of that to relay it back because it, it doesn't seem to be it was well, certainly not general practice within the natural realm to have regular blood work i can even say for myself like it, it's something i think about and i maybe get once a year but it's not something like every i don't know quarter that i am making sure i'm getting these standard blood tests but even i mean there's no excuse now because you can get them relatively easily done even like privately or you can sure. get there's various sure. companies that even come and test these things yeah Ooh. hey pascal here I just wanted to take the moment to talk about our membership site. Inside, you'll find a thriving forum, an extensive exercise library, courses, presentations, and research reviews. All I need you to do is hit the link in the description below and sign up. What do you find, if there's anything common that you find like that's a bit off and what do you change? Is it like training volume and recovery? Yeah, so or the thing is, and, and again, I, I also was really made aware of this more so than anything through myself because the reason why I'm now an enhanced athlete, that started with me going on HRT due to, in 2011, I prepped 11 months Um and I was, I would say in stage condition from June through November. So after that prep, I, you know, I, I had my initial increase in food in December and it was Christmas and the holidays and I really didn't notice it. And then I went to my internship um, and, and my internship was very demanding. My day started at five o'clock in the morning. Most times I was going home around seven thirty, eight at night, but like I was exhausted like to the point of like falling asleep at my desk. And, and I, that was not a part of who Matt Jansen ever was. Um, so I eventually for spring break of that internship, I went home and got initial blood work. And my, my test was at like 240. I don't remember what my free test was at. My thyroid production was downregulated. My TSH was high. Um, so I went then back to my internship. I finished that out in May. I got retested again. My test had then dropped to 180 thyroid was still struggling. So then uh, the other part of the, the equation that's a struggle with natural athletes is most general practitioners, not to discredit them, they don't really understand hormone function within young individuals that are pushing their bodies to an extreme. So they immediately wrote me off that I might have like a, you know, some type of tumor on my pituitary, this, that, the other thing. So I went through all those tests and then I eventually got put on um, testosterone in August of that year. So I went from basically November of being aware of a situation and then, and then testing and testing. Um, so like, that's what really made me aware is this overtraining syndrome, which is a very real thing, especially even in the natural community, because I kind of had this mindset of like, you know, you're, I'm young, I'm bulletproof. I can, you know, train hard and go to failure all the time and train almost every day to not every day. And, and I shouldn't have any negative ramifications from it, but what I've done, especially I, I have two natural guys that I'm working with right now that both had very, very low numbers. And, and I pulled their training volume back to two to three days a week. And then and now we're, we're talking reps in reserve, RPE scale, whatever you want to call it. I usually have them at a six to seven RPE. I'm driving their food up, um, especially their fat intake up. And then just really just monitoring their feedback in terms of, you know, again, for a young male, uh, blood work is great. Also just libido is great. You know, if yeah. you're a young male and your libido is tanked, like something's wrong. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of more of a, a biofeedback marker. I go off of sleep a lot, um, in the natural realm, because in the off season, if you're not sleeping well as a natural athlete, that tells me that you're either overtrained or hormon hormonally, something is off. Uh, obviously the libido is another really good marker, especially if you know what proper libido feels like. And then you've gone through a prep and then it like never returns. That's a red flag, you know? So those are typically the things that I look for. Thyroid function, um, free T3, free T4, TSH, free test, estradiol, um, you know, basing it around those male hormone markers to see where those are at. And typically more often than not, if you are somebody that really, really trains hard and you've spent a long amount of time in a, in a, in a deficit, these things are going to downregulate, but like post contest you've got to get them back up. And that's why I'm not an advocate of like this crawling out of the gates for eight months on end and, and yeah. you know, reverse dieting and adding 10 grams of carbs a week, because you want to reset that hormonal function as fast as you possibly can, if possible.
Yeah, really, really well said. I think it, it's super interesting because I think a lot of people, when they think about hormone dysfunction, they often just think about like females and losing the menstrual cycle, especially as competitors, and then about getting healthy and building that back up. And again, if they, again, crawl it back up, that often it just extends the problem. But yeah, it just it, prolongs it. And that's something else that I did too. I was like, yeah. at that point in 2011, I was obsessed with like seeing like, let's see how high I can get my carbs and still yeah. stay lean, you know, but it wasn't good for me at all. Yeah. Yeah. I think that for generally, I guess there are men who are, we're a bit more resilient for like fat loss. You beat us up a bit more and we're like, we can recover from it. Whereas women necessarily can't, but there are going to be individuals, like you said, even for yourself where like you need to give your body a chance to recover. And it's crazy to think that if you knew what you know now, it, you could have been in a completely different trajectory if you knew like well, oh, honestly I can... if, if i knew what i knew know now i wouldn't have even gone on hrt to yeah. begin with uh, i'm not saying i wouldn't be enhanced because i've always kind of had an interest in that but like the the transition for me wouldn't have been because of having to be on hrt if yeah. i made that decision at all you know yeah um i actually i don't know if you're familiar with will wallace we just brought him on as a formulator for revive Oh, cool. Um, but I, I literally was just having this conversation with him this morning because we're developing a, a test boosting product right now, um, which I, I want to experiment with and try to come off my HRT. And but but with that, I'm going to I'm going to have to initially bridge the gap with using uh, PCT drugs to, to bridge that gap. But I was literally telling him this morning, if I had the knowledge that I have now 10 years ago, I might have never gone down this road to begin with, you know, but now as a dad and, and somebody that's that's more focused on just being a, a really positive impact for my coaching and my businesses like I don't have that desire to draw my to drive my physique anabolically anymore and I just want to be healthy. Yeah. Um, so we're going to do this experiment to see if it works, which will be interesting. Um, but I just want to be a true testament of like okay our, our product works and I'm going to prove it by blood work I'm going to prove it by I'm going to show you how much Novodex and Clomid I'm using initially. But then I'm going to get off that, you know, remain on the product. And then we're going to just show LH and FSH, see where it's at, show where test levels are at and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, then I'll just go back on. Um, but I at least want to try it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That, that sounds really interesting. And I think what you mentioned there, just especially for young guys and using libido as like a biofeedback tool, because I've been there myself where even, well, I have a, a long history with with it, but I won't go into all of that because it, it would just bore the listeners too much and bore you. But even I know from like competing and dieting versus and then staying quite lean for a long time and having like my libido is like, all right. And then I just like, I let myself just mass more effectively, more properly, I guess, let my body fat come up. And I felt like I was like, this is night and day difference. Yeah. It's kind of, yeah. you don't know if you don't know. So it's always worth checking and asking. Sure to see so because the, I mean, the only thing that i want to say too in relation to libido and, and i know that i struggle with this at times so for those of you guys that are listening to this like you have to also separate for yourself we as men can be very driven individuals um and i think like sex for us if you are extremely focused on a task that can be like an expendable that you don't even think about so you you have to really realize like Am I so focused on the end goal that nothing else matters? Because that's a that's a pattern that we can get into as males. Um, so realizing and separating it, is it that? Or is it, you know, truly a lack of desire from maybe hormonal downregulation? Like you also have to do that because there's there's times where I'm 100% okay. But if we have a task at work or I'm very focused on something like that can just easily leave my brain and I, and I never think about it. And I, at that point, it's not a hormonal issue. It's more so of a drive focus thing. So just be aware of that as well. Yeah, well said. I'm not saying every person that preps naturally is going to have libido issues, <laughs> nor, you know, that's not at all what I'm saying. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think it's particularly if they're accompanied by like just general fatigue and maybe even signs of like not, not necessarily depression, but just feelings of like feeling down. Yeah, odd fat holding patterns. That was something yeah. else that I noticed. I was holding fat in areas that I never held fat before and i'm like this is really strange yeah cool so something i did want to also touch on with you matt and we kind of have talked about it a little bit um but i guess this comes into kind of how you drive those relationships with your clients and drive results and a, a hugely important aspect is kind of the check-in process and I, I always find it fascinating especially talking to high level coaches how, how they check in because 
like without data you're blind and so you need right. to gather the right data and also it sometimes can be challenging to get that from clients you, you need to find a balance there as well yeah so i actually what i did last year was i changed all of my check-ins to be done on whatsapp um which i am so thankful for doing because what it's allowed me to do is just have everything organized one steady stream of communication um, and also too, regardless of where I'm at, I can always have my clients data, athletes data right in my hand. Um, and the issue that I was running to in the past, and, and, and a thing for me too, is I'm, I'm really big on time management. So for example, if I have everybody's you know files in a Google drive, um, but then they email me and all their emails are in one chain, but then they start a new email thread that, that isn't in relation to the, the original thread, what I found myself doing was I was having to go to this thread and that thread and then go to this Google Drive and then pull this up. Whereas now everything's just a unified single flow system through WhatsApp. And what the and the other issue that I have is I, is I'm re, I really, really enjoy and I like to be a part of the athletes training process. I like to see their videos. I like to be able to correct where need to. I need I need to want I want to watch execution and effort. So that was another issue because oftentimes they'd say, hey, Matt. Um, you know, my video file is too big. I can't send it to email where you want me to send it. And I'm like, okay, we'll text it. Well, then I got half of the update on my phone and I got the other half an email and, and stuff was just everywhere. So what I did is I just condensed it all to, to WhatsApp and it's, it, it's made a world of difference for me. Um, you know, I can view the videos there. I can see previous check-ins, previous uh, communication, just to make sure that everything's flowing in a consistent pattern. And I've been so like glad that I made that decision to do that because I feel like I'm more effective as a coach now. I feel like I communicate better. Um, I'm not losing information and it's, it's, it's honestly been really good. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that because we use email, Google Sheets and like YouTube Unlisted and we have like a Facebook group and uh, now I think about it, it yeah, it's a little bit of a nightmare sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So you've, you've probably consolidated and uh, systematized that, which is really cool. Uh, what data, like you, your check-ins email most of the time, or are you doing voice notes? Uh, what what does it, it that depends. look like? I do, it, it depends on what they need. If I feel yeah. like an athlete's struggling, or if I have a lot of information that I want to share back to them, um, or just communicate in a way that could potentially be taken wrong via text, I send them a WhatsApp, you know, like a, a voice message. Um, but as far as the, I really, really, nothing irks me more than getting an update with no feedback. Um, I, I, I am not a coach that just looks at your pictures and looks at your weight and says, okay, all is good. Carry on. Like, I really like to know how you're doing, um, sleep markers, digestion markers. Um, the biggest thing for me is uh, I feel like I'm a failure as a coach if I'm not driving and facilitating performance in the gym. So I really like to know how performance is going all the time, you know, and, and that's what I really like to know. So within my check-in process, I, I basically check off those boxes of, okay, let's talk about your digestion, your sleep, your recovery. How well are you performing? Are you having any issues? Um, and then also too, something else I ask is just like, again, about growing relationally, like what happened this week that was good or bad um, outside of your body, you know, outside of, you know, the, the typical just performance marker. So those are the things that I look at. Um, and it, it really has flown well. And then again, like going back to the, the training variable, um, that to me, like, I feel like that's a piece of the puzzle that so many coaches miss out on is, is if they're not actively involved in their athletes training, like we as coaches, that's what we as coaches should be doing, you know? And, and to me, it's so much more than just saying a diet and saying, Hey, you know, go on your merry way. If you don't know what they're doing in the gym, then the diet really, it's, it's just a small part of the puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. I always, I, I think it was from maybe Eric Helms where he described nutrition as permissive to what you're doing in the gym. So I always think of training like the match that lights the fire for muscle gain or muscle yeah. retention. So if, if training, training for me is like you said, it's the most important thing I need yeah. to know what's happening with their training. Cause uh, it normally indicates that a lot of other stuff is going right on the back end if the training sure. is going well. And something I love about you, Matt, is your focus on like execution and technique and things like that. Um, and I think I heard you before say that you actually like to get form videos and check over those, give them good feedback. Yeah, I mean, that. so, so I mean, I, oftentimes I get asked, you know, hey, I have this lagging body part, I have this wrong. Um, should I add more volume? Should I add more frequency? And I, I always say to this person, send me top sets of, of everything that you feel like you're lacking in. Because if, if you don't correct the execution, 
the volume, the adding the frequency, it's just going to be more doing things wrong and nothing's really going to change. Um, and and on, honestly, I'm not like, I know this is like anti-research, but I'm not a huge frequency guy. Um, and I think frequency can kind of band-aid a lack of execution in, in, in many environments. So I really like to hone in on the execution and then make sure that that's right. Once the execution's right, then I hone in on, on trying to get that person to fully execute effort. And then that fixes a lot of problems. I'm not saying that there's not environments where you need more frequency. I'm not saying that at all. But I think for a lot of people, they jump the frequency gun when really they should be recommitting to execution within movement patterns. Yeah, I think I can definitely see that myself with even myself and my own training and clients where you talked about like frequency and volume, like people look at those and they're like more is better. But when you have sometimes when you have so much to do, then the quality and the execution can lack and the intensity. Whereas when you consolidate that and you've only got so many like sets or so many times a week to really give it your all, you end yeah. up executing much better. So you can, I, I like that approach of stripping it back before you think about adding. Yeah. I mean, even like, so, so a common thing is Matt, Matt, my biceps are bad. My arms suck. Um, you know, but if your arms suck and adding four more sets of arms, when your front delt is taking over on set number one, that's not going to make your arms any better, you know? So like you have to figure out why your arms suck before you add volume. And then you're just overstressing the other muscle groups that you're incorporating to move the, the weight in the first place. Yeah. And something I really find interesting with you, Matt, as well, you posted about kind of uh, how you like a bent over row within a program. And I know, again, there's, I guess it, it feels like it's recent, but it might not be recent where it's kind of looking at like biomechanics, anatomy and using machines and chest supports a lot for kind of back movements. And so the bent over rows looked as something in some people's eyes, it's fallen out of favor, but you seem to think it's quite important for a lot of people to do. Uh, I'd yeah, love to hear a bit more. I do. I think that the density and the look that you get from supporting your own weight um, in that pitched over hip hinge position is just, I, I mean, like, Again, I think as coaches, as young coaches, the best thing that you guys can do is be your own body of work. Um, and, and even within myself, like when I really committed for the for the longest time within my off season, when I made the most progress, I did three body weight supported hip hinge movements per back workout. Um, and that's the best progress I've ever seen in my back ever. Um, you know, and, and, and I think the success there is, is I wasn't always deadlifting or RDLing as much, but the density in my erectors from just always supporting myself with load in a stretch position and then elbow driving out of that stretch position over time, it just, it really made a difference. Um, you know, and even on backs on stage, like if you take somebody that does predominantly compound movements versus predominantly machine movements, that's the same weight. When you strip it all away, there's going to be a little bit of a difference there. And in, in some cases, there's not, obviously. Um, but, but more often than not, like when you go to local shows, you can point out the guys who are training hard. You know, I mean, it, you can. And when, when you're talking about a bent over row, I know there's several iterations. What's your preferred um, kind of My, more If upright, I had to pick over? just one, I would say a bilateral dumbbell row. Okay. Hi guys, Steve here. Just wanted to take a moment of your time to remind you of our online coaching service. At Revive Stronger, we pride ourselves on providing personalized service that will take your physique and knowledge to the next level. If you're interested, check the description and sign up. And uh, you're, would... you're quite bent, like I know it sounds silly to say this because it's a bent over row, but some people like to do it a little bit more upright. What's your kind of, are you parallel to the ground? I try to pull, I try to, my, make my initial pull, I would say three inches below my knee. Okay. Three to four inches below my knee. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, no, I think um, I, I'm personally in agreement with bent rows, especially if like, I don't know, deadlifts, like you said, deadlifts can start to becoming very fatiguing as you get very strong. So it's like a bent row is great because you get to train all of that with less load and less fatigue. So right. it tends to yeah. work really well in that way. So um, that's really cool. And something else um, I saw you talk about on your Instagram, which I thought was interesting was uh, the issue with female competitors. Um, and sometimes they have like short term like they just want fat loss really short term and that can sometimes lead to unwanted consequences. Yeah. I mean, when, when I'm coaching, especially females, because every female 
wants to be lean. They, they want to feel good about themselves. Um, there's just, there's a lot of issues, I think, within the female community of the fact that a lot of them have kind of been chronically over dieted. So when it comes to their body continuing to respond in that chronically over dieted state, it gets harder and harder every time. And it gets to the point where your body trusts you less and less to let go of that fat every time. Um, and, and this is a, this is a point that I, that I bring up when I'm working with these girls. Like I, I basically give them an option A and an option B option A is I, I really would love it if you allow me to fully coach you. And I think for me, fully coaching you means that we have to spend time in a prolonged surplus because I feel like the, the path that you're going on is just going to make it very, very hard for your body to continue to be responsive long-term or you know, you have girls that they just don't want to hear it. Um, and, and then with them, it's again, it, it turns into more of that customer service, giving the customer what they want. But at least if I do that, I've said my piece first. Um, and I, you know, again, I, I think sometimes from an, an athlete perspective and within the coaching industry, it's more so like I'm paying you. Um, and this is what I want, which I, I understand. Um, you know, and why would I pay you if I just need to be in a surplus for eight months? And, you know, I'm quote unquote, not really making progress, but yet, internally you could be making a ton of progress you just don't see it um so it's it's a hard conversation to have but i think it's a conversation that needs to be had i think also too again because girls desire and you know the whole social media generation like they desire to have this look that's not really realistic um you know i girls even even their fat body fat percentages of what they should be holding in their off season is skewed and, you know, it, I think it's very important that you coach girls to, to be feminine and, and have feminine amounts of body fat in the off season as, as they were intended to have, you know, more around their hips, more around their waist, because that's how they were created. Um, you know, but again, it's like, it's, it's hard as individuals to, to share that with women that are very set in their ways. But I, I do, I am encouraged. I think there's a trend within the coaching community now where we're, actively trying to take better care of the female athletes that we're working with and just making them aware of, of the issues that are present and how continuing to diet all year long, year after year is going to impact you negatively. Like one of the things I'm honestly, I don't want to say concerned about, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see how a lot of girls show up at shows this year, because I feel like last year, a lot of them like hung on and hung on for the chance to compete and it may have happened or it may not have happened or they didn't compete until November, but yet they died it all year. And now all of a sudden they want to die it again. I'm interested to see what happens. Yeah, it's, I definitely see that. And the, yeah, it's like you said, there's a reason why women have a higher body fat percentage than men. And it's very important for like, just when you're born, like the, I guess, however you got there, your body doesn't care if you're trying to compete. It wants to keep you healthy for reproduction. And so there's like a certain amount of body fat you need to be healthy. Uh, right. And that's not like being shredded year round. And then, like you said, in terms of training, if you aren't in the healthiest way possible, you're not going to see the big improvements in training and that's not going to drive progress. So you're, like you said, you're kind of like that yo-yo dieting where every time it's going to get harder and harder and harder, the fat loss efficiency is even going to drop off. Yeah. So it's really great. And I guess the industry is, I guess, like a lot of industries kind of male dominated. And so some male coaches in the past, and like you said, more presently, it's getting better as more information is coming out. I can see how that could have happened before because yeah again like uh, we kind of uh, i guess some coaches may have treated women not respecting their gender as much as what we do now well, yeah i mean just dieting the same as they would a, ma a yeah. male but the, the response isn't the same and the repercussions on the back end aren't the same either because you uh, i say this with take, take this with a grain of salt but like you can drive a male into the ground over and over again and it's he can get in shape now granted blood work might not look great yeah um but it is it's much more of a reality with a man than it is with a female for sure and actually something i wanted to ask i meant to ask when we were talking about natural and enhanced is uh, as i mainly coach naturals but sometimes i get uh, a guy normally a guy because i mostly work with males who decides he wants to start trying a little bit of like going to the enhanced side and uh, I wanted to ask if you've had that where you've had kind of naturals you've taken them to the enhanced side and what the considerations kind of initially are what kind of do you normally see happen to their training nutrition 
Do you have to uh, body weight? I know that's one of the ones that goes a bit wacky. Uh, is there anything you can share there? Yeah. So the, the first thing I do again, and I don't want to just sound like a broken record here, but I, I really want to see, especially if they're interested in, in changing over. I, I think the first thing that you need to do is get your blood work checked because I'm very curious to see where this person is at naturally. Um, for one, I, like, for example, I had this one gentleman that I worked with that in a natural state, his, his test levels, his total tests and his free tests was extremely high. So we were having this conversation of he wanted to go on cycle. And then after I, I, I looked at his blood work, I encouraged him. Honestly, I was like, dude, I said, I wouldn't do it if I were you because you were like in the elite of natural guys, you know, so like I would just ride this out. Um, but even if, even if he did make the decision to do it, at least we have a baseline because I personally believe that you should build your baseline or build the cycle off of your baseline. So if somebody's free or total test is, let's say 900 naturally, that should give you an indicator of how much testosterone to initially use versus somebody's test who might be 400 naturally you know, and, and kind of base that cycle off of, off of the milligrams of tests you're going to use based off of what their natural production is. Um, so that's, that's an, an initial conversation that I have. And again, it's important to have that baseline. So that way, you know, post cycle, what you're trying to get back to, or at least aiming for to get them back to, and now uh, a post cycle natural state once again. So that's an important thing. Um, the, the body weight, more so you can kind of throw that out the window. It's going to be response based, you know, but it's more so composition. Um, and then just also just making them aware of issues that now that might be present, like you need to monitor your blood pressure uh, because not that all steroids make your blood pressure bad, but if you have a predisposition to say high blood pressure and then you're, you're putting more water on your body quickly um, the, the anabolics themselves are increasing blood pressure. Those things need to be, you need to at least make the natural athlete aware of them. You know, if they have a family history of X, Y, and Z. So those are other things that are important to me. And then just really, and again, I, I mean this wholeheartedly trying to get the most out of the least. Um, so starting them out on the lower end of the spectrum, and then just slowly driving that up one cycle after the other based off of the response to cycle A. And something else too that I think there's a lot of misconception about is that you don't have to like progressively overload your cycle going from natural to enhanced or from enhanced to, you know, if you have a bridge or if you come off, like every time you go back on, you shouldn't have to use more and more and more. And then also too, something I wouldn't do is like just change the compounds that you're using just because like, for example, like I had a gentleman reach out to me and, you know, he was new to, to doing cycles. He had done two, but yet what I saw is that he did cycle one, he had a great response, but then for cycle two, he used two completely different compounds other than tests than he did in cycle one. And I, and I asked him straight up, I'm like, why did you change? You know, you had a great response the first time. Why did you just, randomly pick two other things and not just go back to what worked the first time. And then the, the main thing is, is what they're missing out on is like, it's still up to you to drive the performance to facilitate the, the change for those compounds to then work. It's not like you can just do whatever and the compounds because you're throwing them in are going to work. Um, so again, like just being aware of your starting baseline, start small, get the most out of the least. And then just, if you have a great response, come off and then do that same thing next time. And I guarantee you, you're going to just be able to accelerate that response once again. I'm very thankful. I'm not personally coaching him on the, the drug protocols because I'm absolutely clueless. <laughs> so uh, loads of it just goes in my head and I know how complex that can be. So he has, he has a, a coach helping him with that. But in terms of, uh, so I'm interested also in like training and nutrition. Do you, do you change anything or do the same kind of principles apply and it just, you just kind of, like change it according to like body weight, recovery, those sort of aspects you just look I, I Honestly, I don't, man, because I, yeah. I really, I'm a big believer in rest. Um, and, and for both camps, I'm a big believer in rest and I'm, a, and I'm a big believer in low volume. So I don't really make a ton of changing, you know, considerations. The only thing that's going to obviously happen is that the enhanced person's ability to recover is going to be quicker, but that doesn't necessarily need mean that they need to do more work. 
And do they get, I don't know if this is right, is there a sudden kind of um, boost in performance, like their strength progression is quite rapid, so you, Could would, be. You need, could, would it be wise, I don't know, to slow that down? That's just something I remember being heard, like not well, yeah, to I mean, kind of jump your, the gun. Your muscle can be growing faster than the surrounding ligaments for sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that can even happen in a, you know, going from a, a pre-contest phase to a rebound off-season phase. Um, so that that is something that you need to be aware of. You know, I think honestly, even when I tore my pec, that was part of what was going on is I was having such a crazy growth that my tendons were right. just having a hard time keeping up. Um, so definitely need to be aware of that on, on the enhanced side for sure. Cool. Uh, and that actually, that's something I wanted to ask about for you. And I know you've mentioned kind of hoping to come off TRT and uh, use the natural test booster. What in terms of uh, your training and everything uh, or for you competitively, I know the, the initial ambitions were to go pro. Is that that's still on the cards for you? You kind of. No, it's, it's not really. It's not a um, it's not nearly as much of a driver as what it once was, um, because ultimately I got into this to be a good coach and, and, and I wanted I love bodybuilding to my core. Um, I wanted my own body of work to be a representative of, of what I do and what I believe in. Um, but now at this point, honestly, like my, the, the time that I can allocate for is for being a good coach um, more so than anything else. I want to be a good husband and a good dad. And I want to be really present with my boys. So within my day, if I have an extra two hours of, of, of my day, I'm going to choose to spend that with my boys rather than, than driving my own physique and performance up because that's just where I'm at in my life. Yeah. Um, and again, I, I don't know if I talked about this on the last one, but like Sean, um, winning with Sean has really helped me in this. Like, I don't feel like this burden that I have to turn pro anymore because what yeah. I accomplished with Sean is, is greater than anything I can accomplish within my own body. Um, and I'm just really proud of that. And it's also just given me this sense of relief that like, I don't need to prove anything to anybody anymore, you know? So, and, and really, I, I just, I love being a dad more than I love being a bodybuilder and, and they're going to win. Those guys are going to, my boys are going to win. That's awesome. No, I think that's, that's, it's nice to hear that. Yeah. You, you obviously have thought about it and there's pros and cons and you've decided kind of like, yeah, I'm just, I'm not I'm just rather really than trying to do everything. I'm, yeah. I'm at peace. Like I don't, I just, I don't care what people think. Um, now, now, granted, if I was single and I, you know, I was in a different business situation, then, then yeah, I probably would. But like at yeah. this point, like what, why, you know, no, um, because some, if I do it and if I committed to that, something else is going to lack yeah. and I can't afford for something else to lack. Yeah. It's really interesting also, actually, from a coaching perspective, I, I feel that pressure of to kind of perform. Uh, and like, I can see when like you've kind of proved yourself like in your skills and prowess through a client. Um, so yeah. I can see how that's really kind of, yeah, freeing in a way. Yeah. And, and again, like even in Q and A's, like I do on Instagram and stuff, like I get asked all the time, like as a young coach, how do you build? And for one thing I get asked often and it kind of bothers me. It's like, how do you build your brand? Right. Um, and I never focus at all on building my brand. I just try to convey my passion. But within that part of my passion was driving my physique, own physique up. So young coaches, you, those of you guys that like haven't really maybe even earned that much trust in, in, in the game yet or don't have that great of a body of work, like, yes, absolutely for you, I would continue to drive up your own progress. Yeah. Um, I'm just to a point where I, I just don't feel like that's necessary or the risk is worth the reward, yeah. um, you know, and, and I'm good with that. Yeah. No, I think that's good advice. Even I can't attest to being a young coach because I think I'm even older than <laughs> than you, Matt. How old, uh, how old are you? I'm uh, turning 31 in like okay, a month. Okay, so I, I got you by a month. year. Oh, okay. I got you by a year. <laughs> so I'm not far off, but uh, even for myself as like someone who's, I've been full-time coaching since 2015. So uh, a little less time than you, but it was all like the initial growth was I had no client transformations or like progress, particularly it was all myself and sharing my journey. So I, I can completely agree that at least that can definitely build a baseline of kind of clients where they kind of, there's uh proof in the pudding in, in a sense, uh, as in you can see it through your own work. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, one final question uh, in terms of obviously, and I don't, I don't know why I find this funny. I don't know. I was trying to, I was going to try and make a joke because uh, you're the co-founder of Revive. Obviously my company's Revive Stronger. So I was yes. going to, I think, I don't know when you launched the company, but I think it, it probably, it may have come after us, but it, it doesn't matter. I was going to try and make a joke out of it. Um, but obviously you made uh, Get Raw Nutrition as well. Um, and something I just wanted to ask was uh, 
kind of some of your favorite supplements that you've come out with? I was just interested to hear. So my favorite supplements, um, that's a good one. On the revive side, what I've seen the most impact in personally um, is our blood pressure product. I get a ton of positive feedback on the blood pressure and on the lipid. Uh, and those are two that I had a direct hand in formulating. So I, that, that really is something like I'm proud of. And, and honestly, Dom and I got into this to just make an impact in people's lives. And, and I saw basically how much I was delegating out uh, in terms of vitamin and supplement use. And we just wanted to try to do it on our own and just make it more um, easy to access system for these things. So the blood pressure, and another cool story too, is that, so my mom, um, and I didn't even know that this was going to happen, but when, when I was nine years old, my mom got in a really bad accident and she's had really bad migraines ever since. Um, and, and something about the Indian herbs within our blood pressure formula have helped her to not have a migraine ever since she started using it. So that's been huge. Um, on, on, on Dom's side, his dad only has one kidney from kidney cancer. So the kidney formula that we have has helped him out with his bun, his creatinine, his EGFR has increased. So again, like being able to help impact and help our own family has been a huge part of that. So I would say on the revive side, those, those two have been really big for me. Uh, we have a prostate formula that I've seen a ton of, of great PSA feedbacks and in, in, in men's blood work. So that's been really encouraging. Um, on the raw side, the raw side to me, you know, there's a, there's a passion in creating supplements because in the industry, I think that the ingredients are put in products at dosages that they're able to show on the label, but really aren't effective. So that's kind of been like the driving force within raw for us is to just really dose the products properly. Yeah. Um, and, and because of that, you know, just being transparent, the margins are not the same as what it is for other companies because we're putting a lot more in the product. Um, so I'm just really proud of that, you know, in and of itself, we're not cutting quarters within our formulations. We're not putting like 0.5, you know, milligrams of something in there just to show it on the label and, and put it on the front of the label. But when you actually turn it around, like there's nothing there that's efficacious at all. So that's what I'm really proud about within the, the, the raw line is, is that we've really stuck to our guns. Um, you know, something else too, like I, I really like cluster dextrin, cyclic dextrin carbs. Um, a lot of companies now are putting a small amount in, but then putting a lot of P carb in because it's cheaper, you know, and that's something that we're not doing. And, and granted, you can buy their intra workout carb cheaper than ours, but yet what are you getting? Yeah. You know, so. I guess it comes down to a similar to the discussion at the start in terms of like pricing a coach. Don't pick a coach by the price uh, because like well, you, you may pay, you may get what you pay for in, in a sense, sure. but for supplements, it, it almost is always the case you pay for what you get. And obviously some brands have that notoriety, uh, notoriety even, and they can charge a load for it. But it, it's refreshing to know that you've actually taken the time to make sure that you're putting eff efficacious doses, you've done the research. So when people buy this, they buy it again because they actually get the result they want rather than just like they use it and they just don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Awesome. Matt, I think we actually covered off all the questions I had for you. So this has been a great discussion. I really appreciate you coming back on. If people want to find out more from you, and I guess I can link up to all those, your, your supplement companies as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, again, thank you guys. I don't like, the thing is, is at, at the closing of these podcasts, I, I don't really want to make it about me. If you guys have any questions based off of anything that I said today, um, you can use my Instagram. It's Matt Jansen 8 or I also want to preface in saying this, I do get a lot of messages every day. So the, the best way to reach me is through email, which is matt at camp-jansen.com. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. I really appreciate that, Matt. And I think this, you're kind of giving nature in this sense and how you just want to leave the kind of the industry in a better place. I mean, it's just shown throughout this episode and I just want to say it's it's incredibly refreshing to see someone, especially at your level with the kind of audience you have where you could quite easily go into like, I don't know, you could put out any supplement and people would end up buying it, but you're making sure to stick to your roots. And I think like, just keep, keep that going because it, it's great to see. Thank you, and, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome. So guys, thank you very much for listening. Um, definitely go check out Matt's stuff and uh, yeah, definitely go and ask him your questions. I always see you putting up question boxes on Instagram as well, which is always nice because yeah, again, uh, your time is precious. You've got a lot on your plate, so it's cool to see that. And yeah, guys, we'll talk to you soon. Take care.
So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Flor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. The Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people, uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is gonna be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there, you can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. There's also gonna be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics. Discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.